Forum. I am pleased and truly honored to have as our special guest today the Honorable Joshua Fischer, Germany's Foreign Minister and Vice Chancellor in the government of Gerhard Schroeder from 1998 to 2005. Minister Fischer was a leading figure in Germany's Green Party, and according to opinion polls, he was the most popular politician in Germany for most of the duration of the Schroeder government. In 1999, facing down the majority of his own party, who opposed Germany's military in involvement in Kosovo, Minister Fischer supported the German participation in the Kosovo War. That meant that for the first time since World War II, German soldiers would actively participate in combat in the NATO-led intervention in Kosovo. He argued that pacifism cannot be honored in the face of genocide and ethnic cleansing amidst allegations that Serbia was planning to commit genocide against the Kosovo Albanians. Yashka Fischer was also in favor of stationing German troops in Afghanistan, but he advised Chancellor Schroeder not to join the U.S.-led war in Iraq in 2003. By the time he left office in October of 2005, he was the second longest-serving foreign minister in German's post-war history. The foreign minister asked office is regarded as the second most powerful position in the German government. Minister Fischer is currently the Frederick H. Schultz Class of 1951 Professor of International Economic Policy in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs of Princeton University. He also has an appointment uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Joshka Fischer to our program. It is truly an honor to have you with us today. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me begin by asking you, in 2003, you advised your Chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, not to support the U.S. invasion of Iraq. What were your reasons? Did you know something that the Americans did not know? No, I think we had more or less the same level of uh, knowledge, of information, of intelligence, uh, but uh, um, I didn't believe that uh, uh, there was enough evidence uh, to go to war. Um, Saddam was in a box. Uh, Blix and his team uh, uh, was uh, in the country, were in the country, and uh, uh, the inspection the teams, inspection teams mm -hmm. and uh, uh, led by Hans Blix at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, there was no reason uh, to stop that process. Um, uh, they worked, I think, very efficiently on the ground. Uh, so um, uh, from, from my assessment, uh, all the questions which were raised in 91, not by leftists, but by Colin Powell, by, um, uh, at that time, President George Bush, the first. James Baker, uh -huh. Uh, Brand Scowcroft, uh, all these questions uh, were valid uh, uh, not to go into Baghdad because to go into Baghdad means to take over the responsibility uh, for the whole of the Middle East. And uh, I was not sure uh, whether the Americans, uh, the American people, the American voters uh, definitely knew what that would mean. And uh, the third question was how to avoid that Iran will be the big winner because bringing democracy to uh, Iraq, and Iraq was an artificial uh, colonial construction constructed by uh, uh, the British Foreign Office. And um, it was an artificial state from the very beginning. So uh, bringing democracy to Iraq means Shiite ma majority, and Shiite majority means uh, to strengthen um, decisively the influence of Iran. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of contradictions and the reasons to go to war uh, we didn't share, so we said no. Mm. Your assessment of the situation in Iraq now, uh, this was last week's Newsweek, the, the cover story says we're losing but not all is lost. Do you think that America has lost? <coughs> I don't believe that uh, a change to the better will be possible in the future. 
um, the price is tremendously high. It's Iraqi uh, population, but also young Americans die there every day. Um, and uh, thirdly, what will be the consequence for the region? Mm -hmm. uh, as I said before, it's an artificial state. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, without a new national consensus between the Kurds, the Shiites, and the Sunnis, I think it will be almost impossible to avoid a civil war. And behind Shiites and Sunnis are regional powers, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, which are also part of this uh, um, uh, situation in the region. So um, uh, I think the future will be very grim. Very grim. So what should we do now? Well, I think uh, it's very important uh, uh, that uh, you try to, to change the regional setting. Um, Such as? Talking with Iran. Mm -hmm. It's not only about um, uh, Iraq. I'm also concerned about the recent developments uh, uh, in Afghanistan, where terrorism uh, came back, uh, where an insurgency yeah. came back. And once again, here the regional players, especially um, Iran and Pakistan, are key. So you have to talk to, tem to them. You have to try to engage them in a positive process. Mm -hmm. uh, Syria is another element. Uh, I think uh, Syria is, is key for a, a change uh, in the strategic setting in the region. If it would be possible to bring them over, it would have tremendous positive effects for Israel, mm -hmm. um, Lebanon, but also for Iraq. So uh, try to rearrange uh, the strategic setting would be my advice. And then move forward with the disengagement. In the meantime, though, what should be done to the 144, and some say 150,000 American troops in Iraq right now? Should there be a drawdown timetable? Well, together with, uh, I think, um, a different regional strategy and approach. Without that, I think the situation will be very complicated. It will be not an easy task if you are able to change uh, the regional environment. Because in Iraq, it's not only about Iraq. Everybody now is watching very carefully in the region, or not only in the, in, the clo in, the, in the closer region, but also in the more broader region. Even in, in, in Pakistan and India, everybody is watching very carefully what the next weeks and months uh, will bring, uh, which decisions will be made in Washington, D.C., because this will have a tremendous impact uh, for all the players there. So I think um, an engagement in a positive way uh, to prepare the disengagement and avoid a collapse of Iraq, uh, that's exactly uh, what it should be done in the next uh, weeks and months. Mm -hmm. you, you've said um, very clearly what you think we should do, but knowing what you do know about this government, the Bush White House, and all the intricacies of diplomacy, of, of other considerations. What do you think will actually happen uh, in Iraq, the future of Iraq? Do you see a, a unified Iraq or a, a federated, a partitioned Iraq, the three-state solution, as Leslie Gelb had uh, once advocated? Well, this is um, a very important question, ma'am, because uh, the Middle East is different, and especially uh, based on, on the European history and experience, we understand the sensitivity of borders. Now, beyond Egypt and um, Iran, very old civilizations and states, um, the whole of the Middle East was created uh, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, at the end of the First World War. So the borders are mostly drawn uh, in, uh, in the Foreign Office or in the Quai d'Orsay in, pa in, in Paris, in the Foreign Ministry in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, these borders are uh, questionable and uh, were questioned and will be questioned uh, if uh, uh, it, um, it, it uh, is convenient to the interests of uh, some of the players. Uh, these borders are very young. The states are very young. So uh, starting um, uh, to disintegrate existing states, uh, you don't have a guarantee where it will, be, where it will end. That it will if, not go beyond Iraq's yeah, borders. That's exactly what we are talking about. So to preserve the territorial integrity uh, would be key for stability and peace in the region. But uh, on the other side, you won't get that without a new national consensus. And I don't see... Uh, 
reading the newspapers, watching the TV reports, that there is a, a serious option for a new national consensus. The Kurds have their own interests, mm -hmm. the Shiites have their own interests, and the Sunnis have their own interests. Mm -hmm. So the second question will be, if you can't keep Iraq together, which I definitely don't know, I think it's in our interest to keep it together. Mm -hmm. But if not, can you contain it into Iraq, or will it be there a spillover effect in a middle-term perspective for the whole region? If this will take place, then we will be in a very, very serious mess, much more serious than the mess is today. Would you say that should that worst-case scenario happen, wouldn't that be the price that the United States paid for its unilateralism? What, what well, I don't want to look back. I mean, uh, uh, this is, uh, we have to look forward. And uh, from, fr as an outsider, as a friend of the United States who loves this country and thinks uh, that this is the indispensable uh, nation uh, for uh, a better world order, um, I think it's key that uh, the United States will develop uh, a new national foreign policy consensus. If every four or eight week, uh, years the pendulum will swing into the extremes, mm. uh, I think this will create not only for the U.S., but for all the allies, friends of the United States, um, a very, very, to use diplomatic words, complicated situation. So. I'm more interested in look forward and uh, uh, there to reach a new uh, national consensus, also internationally based with the allies and friends. Uh, this would be, uh, I think, perfect. So basically, you're really saying that that international cooperation, multilateralism, is uh, the calling of the day. Well, it's not only the calling of the day, it's the calling of the century. I mean, if, if I would have uh, uh, asked you uh, 15 years ago whether you would believe that the U.S. economy uh, will depend from decisions of the central bank of communist China one day, I think you would have thought this guy is crazy. But this is now the reality mm -hmm. of today. Mm -hmm. If you look to the global issues, the global uh, uh, environmental issues, um, the tremendous growth rate in, in China, in India, in East and Southeast Asia, in South Asia, um, you will see that all these problems are problems of uh, a globalized mankind. And this is a two-way street. Um, in the old days, it was impossible mm -hmm that uh, a group of terrorists um, with an organization basis in, in the mountains of Afghanistan could have attacked uh, the most uh, important power in the world. It happened in 9-11. This is also an element, a very alarming element of globalization, weapons of mass destruction. The um, environmental, global environmental challenges, climate change at the top, um, the resources, resources management for a growing um, global economy, uh, all this, uh, I mean, you, you can only solve in negotiations and cooperation. So w even, even if we don't like it, we will be forced by history and globalization uh, into a, 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 an international system which will be based on cooperation. Everybody depends uh, from this process, even the most powerful. Turning to Afghanistan. What is your sense of what's going on, and, and where, where do we go from here? Well, I mean, two, two, two elements are key. First of all, Afghanistan needs a long, long period, um, and it must be done by the Afghanis by themselves. So to guarantee that, um, you need a strong central government, which can... Which there is not now. Which there is, I mean, this is a, a, a development. This is a process. Um, we achieved a lot. When I look back to, um, uh, to 2001, uh, uh, 2002, I mean, the situation has changed uh, uh, to the better. It's no question about that. On the other side, if you look forward, there's a lot to do and it will be a very long process. So mm -hmm. you need a s strong central government which can deliver security 
and uh, keep the country together. There, I think we should focus on, especially now, on police, the judicial system, and the police. Um, the army, um, uh, the the reconstruction of the army, I think, produced uh, pretty good results. Um, so we must work on that. And secondly, a new regional consensus. Uh, without uh, the consent uh, of the major players around Afghanistan, uh, it will be very complicated. And wh which are the major players in the region are Pakistan, Pakistan Iran, Iran, and in the north, uh, Russia, and behind Pakistan, India is playing a very important role. Right. So you can't discuss Afghanistan with the Pakistanis without uh, Right. having um, the Kashmir and the Indian-Pakistani relation and the Kashmiri conflict looming in the background. So uh, there is no, no discussion about that mm -hmm. without uh, uh, this uh, framework, mm -hmm. um, you have to understand. And on the other side, Iran, I mean, it's the framework, of what will be the future of the Iranian-U.S. relations, what about regime change, and so on. Mm -hmm. And in the North Russia, what will be the role of Russia and China is playing more and more an important role. So it seemed to be also uh, uh, the battlefield of regional interests, and you have to neutralize that. And there I think the West, especially the United States and Europe, are playing a very important role. Um, are you concerned about a Taliban takeover or retake of the government in Afghanistan? I mean, if the Taliban, if we would be foolish enough and say for a while, uh, and if the Taliban will take over, we will have this, I mean, this, this, the same situation uh, than pre-9-11. If you look to the border region, mm -hmm. to part of the border region, uh, Vasiristan, uh, I mean, you have there now, again, a restructuring of uh, al-Qaeda. And with the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, you would have a, a broader organization basis. There were... If you look to the history of Iraq and Afghanistan conflict, in Iraq you had uh, many, many changes uh, for the reasons to go to war, for the strategic uh, goals. Um, in Afghanistan we never had a change, uh, neither in the reasons nor in the goals mm -hmm. uh, or in the interests. We have to stick to that, but on the other side, strengthening the national government and national institutions and on the other side, creating a new na into a regional uh, framework and consensus. This is the way into the future, and this will also, I think, one day um, open the door for a reduced international presence in Afghanistan. Now, Germany plays an important role in Afghanistan. How many troops do you have there? Well, we have several thousand there. Several the thousand, moment. but they are not in combat uh, roles. Well, this is an ongoing discussion, and my position right. is quite clear. Our allies, the UK and uh, Canada, are fighting, and uh, NATO is a military alliance based on solidarity, and we should really help them. So, in other words, you would like to see that the German troops in Afghanistan... I would not like to see. I think it's, it's from my it point of view, they, 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 they should do that. It's a question of solidarity. Yeah. Now... Uh, just a quick question on uh, uh, Iran and North Korea. How concerned are you that they have both gone nuclear? <coughs> well, I think North Korea has a very negative effect because uh, it's a rotten regime, a terrible dictatorship. Um, and now they managed it uh, uh, to become a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So uh, many, many... Um, the smaller and middle-sized states around the world will, will now re reassess their position. If such a rotten regime can do it, why not, uh, why not uh, we, I mean, uh, not Germany, I mean, uh, those people who are asking and, uh, uh, this question. And it has, of course, uh, an encouraging effect for Tehran. Tehran is much more dangerous because it's... it's, it's uh, North Korea want to survive as a regime by isolation. Mm -hmm. um, Tehran uh, tries uh, to play the role of the regional mm -hmm. dominant power, the mm -hmm. hegemonial, mm -hmm. regional hegemonial power. And uh, the effect will be that um, several neighbors, uh, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, 
uh, whoever will reconsider their position. Mm -hmm. um, Israel and some others will see that as an existential threat and react. Um, so if uh, Iran will go nuclear, I would bet that the consequence will be um, uh, uh, more in instability in the region, and driven and, and by a nuclear yeah. arms race. Arms race, and yeah. this will completely change the security posture of Europe too. Yeah. So, so, so you think we should engage in direct talks with Iran and also North Korea? Yes. Uh, right away. Definitely. Right Definitely. Away. Without delay. Without delay. Maybe, maybe we lost too much time. Um, now. On German-U.S. relations, how much has it recovered from the low days of uh, uh, 2003 after Germany refused to, to go with America? Well, from my point of view, it was never as bad as it was uh, discussed in the, in, the, in the press. For example, on the level of the intelligence uh, cooperation of the security services um, on many other fields, um, even on the level of the cooperation of the Secretary of State at the Foreign Ministry or uh, uh, Interior Ministry um, uh, with the, our Interior Ministry uh, with um, uh, the General Attorney here, it was always uh, excellent. Uh, so from my point of view, um, it was a question how we define friendship. And I think if things get serious, a friend has the duty to talk um, his friend the truth. And uh, from the I very Including beginning, if the friend is wrong. Especially if the especially. friend is wrong. I mean, if the friend is right, you don't need a, a friend uh, mm -hmm. to get applause. Everybody will say you are a nice guy. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you have the feeling, and I mean it in a very serious way, if you think the friend is making a terrible mistake, mm -hmm. then my definition of friendship is not to say, okay, we'll follow you, but my definition is to say, reconsider it. It's, it's really a serious mistake. Uh, that's my definition of friendship, and we did it. And uh, I think we were proven right. Um, uh, not, I mean, we agreed that after 9-11 there must be a change in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and there was a broad, broad highway of responsibility which led, led us together to Afghanistan. I mean, we put our government at risk to go with our military force together with our allies in the United States uh, into Afghanistan. Uh, but Iraq, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we thought this will be a terrible mistake. Don't do it. The reasons are not valid. The strategy is not seriously um, defined. The consequences are not in a serious way uh, considered. So our recommendation was, uh, if you want to change, and you must change, we must change together the Middle East, uh, it, it must be a more democratic Middle East. But for a more democratic Middle East, you need the backing of the majority. That's the definition of democracy. And to get the backing of majority, uh, the next step would have been uh, to broker um, uh, an honest, sustainable, maybe painful middle uh, peace between Israel and the Arabs, Israel and the Palestinians. And then with the full credibility of an honest peace broker, plan carefully the next steps. Mm -hmm. Saddam was not a direct threat from our assessment. He was in the box. Mm -hmm. It was not the issue. The issue was changing the Middle East because there was a threat of terrorism and there was a threat of weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, Saddam is an uh, evil person, a terrible dictator, but at that time he was not uh, the problem uh, uh, which uh, had to be tackled. What do you see uh, is the role of Germany in the world today? What would you like it to be? It's complicated to explain for a non-European uh, audience because foreign policy is still national-based, so German foreign policy but uh, even for the most powerful two European nations, P5, permanent members in the Security Council, nuclear powers, France and UK, without Europe, uh, they are playing also uh, all only a, a very reduced role in, uh, in the global system of today and tomorrow. So um, our common challenge is Europe. And uh, Europe will play, I think, the key role, or we will lose altogether if we can't manage it 
to overcome uh, the obstacles, especially to form a common European foreign and security policy. Uh, it's our common security. We cannot define German security without Polish, French, um, Hungarian, or Italian, or mm -hmm. Spanish security. It's European security. And uh, it's also a common market now and must become, uh, I think, uh, a more united uh, foreign policy force. Speaking of German security, um, how dependent is Germany on Russia's oil and gas? Germany has just signed this 5 billion uh, euro uh, contract with, with, with Russia to get energy. And does that not tie you more to Russia? Yes and no. It's a European uh, dependency because it, it, we, we have the reality of the common market. We have the reality of the euro. Uh, I mean, it, it, would be, it would be naive or maybe even stupid mm. to think Germany would have enough gas, mm. but Poland would have a shortage. The markets would immediately react and our division um, of labor um, is is uh, so sophisticated. So um, uh, the British, the German, the French, or whoever um, industry would be within a few days uh, shut down because the parts won't, won't come from Poland, Hungary, or wherever. So it's a European reality. And of course, we have any interest in uh, excellent uh, strategic relations with Russia, not only based on the energy dependency, uh, but also because Russia will be a key factor um, and was a key factor in the European history since uh, uh, the 17th century. But on the other side, it's also quite clear, Europe has interests. And uh, one of the core interests is that we are not going back to the rules uh, of the empire days. And uh, therefore, an independent Ukraine, uh, an acceptance of human rights, uh, an acceptance of the rule of law in our relations with Russia uh, is another element. So it's, we are working on that. Uh, and the third element is uh, we must reduce our in, uh, dependency um, from uh, nuclear energy or from fossil energy. Yeah, That's yeah. the common challenge. And uh, we achieved a lot there in Germany. And, but uh, not enough. Huh? Not no. yet, yeah. I mean, we need, it's, it depends very strongly on the prices. Uh, we need a, a serious push, maybe uh, compared with the Manhattan Project or so, but in a peaceful way, uh, to go through and uh, to reduce our dependency yeah. uh, from, uh, from fossil uh, energy and nuclear energy, yeah. because, I mean, nuclear energy always has the risk that something will go wrong and then you have right. a, a national catastrophe yeah. which will be unbelievable. Right, right, yeah. But, but also, you, we, I guess everyone uh, in the high energy consuming uh, 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 areas need to have a much more sensible energy policy. Russia has just raised the prices of gas to Georgia, doubled the prices. And who is to say that it, Russia will not you know, double or triple the prices to of its gas and oil supplies to to yeah, Europe yeah. someday. Yeah, but the market, the market, the European market is more powerful. Believe me, yes. I mean, and uh, uh, blackmailing would be very short-sighted. Uh, <laughs> the reaction, uh, the European reaction on uh, when Russia um, uh, reduced uh, the transport of gas last winter, uh, the European reaction was, I think. Uh, um, uh, quite blunt, and uh, uh, from my assessment, this was a big mistake of Putin. My uh, final question to you, because our time is just about up, is that considering that you were the most popular politician in Germany for many, many years, uh, do you have any plans, perhaps, to run for the chancellorship of uh, Germany, oh, equivalent no. of the White House? No, I always no. used to say to Gerhard Schröder at that time, uh, the chancellor and my boss, Maybe I'm the only German who is not interested in your office because I watch too closely what it means to be chancellor now. Uh, my life in uh, domestic politics uh, is definitely, uh, came definitely to an end. There is no way back. So you will play the role of an elder statesman doling yeah. out very sage, sage advice. Exactly. I mean, yes. that's what I do here in the university. 
uh, teaching uh, students, uh, I write a book, uh, um, articles, uh, have nice interviews, uh, um, anything like that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's in, in every lifetime, uh, you must know when you have to close the door because uh, um, a period uh, has come to an end. Thank you, Minister Jaschka Fischer. It was truly a pleasure and honor to have you on our program today. Thank you very much. This is Mei Chang. Thank you for watching uh, International Forum today. See you next time. Mm -hmm.